All right, quick question. And here's, a, here's one I use in interviews a lot, and it helps me understand behavioral traits. It's an easy one you can use. I tell people, answer this question, don't overthink it real quick. Rules are made to be? All right. Everyone in here is usually low conformity. Low conformity people usually answer, rules are made to be broken. People that are high conformity tend to answer, rules are made to be followed. It's a great way to find out what kind of conformity level they are. Someone says rules are made to be broken, I want them to be a chef in my restaurant. Is low conformity a good thing or a bad thing? Bad thing. <laughs> because they don't have attention to detail. They're going to break their own rules. All right? Now, here's the thing I always say, too, is awareness precedes choice. Choice precedes change. If you're aware of how you're wired, you can take steps to kind of counteract it and also work so you don't have that problem. I'm low conformity. I use, you know, you've probably heard my phone go off on alarms. I use alarms, I use reminders, I use notes all the time to keep myself on track. But I know those things about myself. Today, this afternoon, we're gonna kick off with probably one of the things that most people have struggles with. And I'm always shocked when I go to a restaurant, or actually when I do speaking especially, I'll ask a crowd, it doesn't matter how big the crowd is, I've done crowds, you know, small groups like this, I've done a like, nightclub and bar show, I'll have 700, 1,000 people in a room. It's crazy. I'll ask everyone this question. How many people in here know the cost of everything on their menu down to the penny? And 3% of people raise their hand. It doesn't matter how big the crowd is, it's always sad. One of the things I tell all my clients, all my members, if you don't know your numbers, you don't know your business. In fact, you don't have a business, what you have is a hobby. A very, very expensive hobby. So, food cost is one of those things that you should know. And I make the joke all the time, it's like, you know, you think Apple doesn't know the cost of everything that goes into making this phone? Down to the penny, they know exactly. And what happens when the price of stuff goes up? Your phone goes up or they scale back production and it make it harder to get one and your wait times go out longer and longer. So, there's nothing wrong with scaling back production to make the cost work. You gotta make the numbers work. If the numbers don't work, the numbers don't work. But there's always, usually there's a way you can make the numbers work. And the number one thing we're gonna work on today is talking about food costing. Now, I talked to you about this before. Food cost and the food cost boot camp is one of the many uh, kind of workshops and sub-workshops I do in the restaurant accelerator. This one goes into the product phase. And we're in the restaurant accelerator, and especially the boot camp, this one has quite a few different workshops. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven workshops in the food cost boot camp. Today, we're gonna to talk about the very first one, so if people are in the accelerator program, you're gonna get a refresher course. So this is a good one, because we're gonna talk about what I've known as the 40 Thieves of Food Cost. The 40 Thieves of Food Cost is my number one tool for understanding where your food cost problems lie. And I almost, I actually, I use it almost like a checklist because it's that valuable. And here's a beautiful thing. This, and what I'm really sad about, this 40 Thieves of Food Cost has been around since the 70s. A food, a, a professor at a university came with this 40 Thieves of Food Cost and he's been teaching it since the 70s and I'm always really shocked when most restaurant owners go, I never heard of it before. It's been around like 1970 something. It's huge. Start off with a quote, of course. When you know the impact of the little expenses, you'll realize that there's nothing little in this world. Candy, do the pennies add up? Quite quickly, right? <laughs> death by a thousand cuts. Death by a thousand cuts, right. Yeah. And he talked about the problem, the, the, you know, the, the thing about compounding. You know, if you took, if you're a good golfer and you took the 10 cents a hole compounded kind of bet with him, you'd end up playing, paying a lot at the end on the 18th hole. Same thing, little things in your business do matter. And there's some simple things that you might see every day that you do not really pay attention to in the sense that you might not think it's a big deal. Hashtag, everything's a big deal. <clears throat> we talked about this week. Over the last couple days, we talked about 
you know, raising your standards, holding your team accountable. We talked about accountability. We talked about culture. We talked about a lot of things. And the biggest thing you got to do is you got to get your bar back up to what your standards are. Talk about the Daily Five Sermon. Talk about my mission, my core values, my vision, my standards, my expectations, and also words of appreciation. Hashtag write this down. You got to know your numbers. Got to know your numbers. You want to know your numbers better than anybody. Remember Bo talked a little bit about food service distribution and when you go to try to negotiate a PVA, a prime vendor agreement, or a food service contract with your, your, you know, with your vendors, there's certain numbers you need to know. What's your average case cost? There's certain things you need to know because when you know the numbers, you are the expert. If I walked up to anyone on your team, especially anyone in your kitchen, and I asked them, and I think some of the other guys said this, you know, what does a spatula cost? What does a, you know, a ladle cost to replace? They, nobody knows. No one knows all that stuff is. Most guys in your kitchen, what's the case of romaine cost today? Nobody in your kitchen knows. These are things you want to educate people. One of the things I'm huge on is transparency. I want to share my numbers with my team. Now, some people get a little angsty. <laughs> about sharing all their financials, like, you know, the bottom line, how much you're putting in the bank, because they don't want people to know, because what does everyone think? Because you're a restaurant owner, you're rich. Yeah. <laughs> you're a restaurant owner, you must be rich. You must be, you must be rolling it. Yeah. If you own a business, you're rich. You're, you know, oh my God, they must, I, I know the armor car must show up at the back door and just take the bags of cash out of here every night. So many bags of cash. I know Ryan's just like, you know, I just, I had to hire extra people just to pack the bags. Yeah, just to pack the bags of cash. Yeah. Now, I do, I did work for a client who used to do concessions at, like, the fairgrounds. Now, that guy actually did have bags of cash. Yeah. He had, like, eight, I was like, like 12 of those money counter machines in the back, and they were, like, stuffing it in bags as fast as they could, and they had armor trucks pulling up. It was crazy. That's, like, the most cash I've ever seen. They make tons of bank, right? Yeah, they, yeah. And, but nice thing, it's only short time, though. Yeah, but they rank in the cash. The 40 Thieves of Food Cost. In the members area, you will see a copy of this. This is the 40 Thieves of Food Cost. They're broken down by categories. Purchasing, receiving, storage, preparation, production, service, sales. If you notice, on the 40 Thieves of Food Cost, there's only one <laughs> about paying too much for a product. But what's the number one thing we bitch about to our vendors all the time? It's too much, too high, too high. How much is your broccoli? Oh, it's too high. I'll go to somebody else, all right? We complain to them all the time. It's too high, too high, too high. Only one thing is cost. Everything else is totally within your control. And most of it is in your control of your team in the sense that they're doing stuff that is not working right for your benefit. Kelly mentioned this to Jennifer, you know, and he, he mentioned a quote from Joe Baum about, you know, yeah, my, my bartenders are my business partners. I just hope I make more money than they do, you know. You might have some people. Food cost thieves are rampant. Sometimes people are food cost thieves, but they might not actually be the thief itself, but they might be an accessory. You got a lot of people on your team that are accessories to theft. And not in the sense that they're taking stuff, but they're not aware of what they're doing is wrong because no one's ever trained them properly. What's our rule about training? We don't train them until they get it right. We train them until they can't get it wrong. See, you guys should try to learn. It's good. I'm going to break these down individually, one by one. And I want you, while we're going through these slide decks, and if you've been through this program, you know, some of my accelerator people are here. If you've already been through this, go back and look from what we've talked about before. Have you taken corrective action to fix these things? But remember, to take no action is an action. It's just stupid action. <laughs> right? Tools are just potential. I have given you, and Kelly and Bo and Zach, we've given you a lot of tools over the last three days. The question now is, after we've gone here and everyone's all pumped up, I got these new things, I got these new tools, are you going to pick up that tool and use it? Tools are just potential. You have to actually pick them up and apply them for them to work. We talked about this too. You know, a lot of times you know exactly what to do. 
but do you do what you know? I love coming to sessions like this and I bring my friends who are super, super talented experts and consultants because they have different viewpoints of stuff. And I'm telling you, most of the stuff has been around the industry for a long time, but I have tons of notes because I get stimulated. Oh my God, yeah, I forgot about that. Oh my God, that's a great one to bring up. I learned too. Restaurants become better when the people in them become. See, you guys are learning really well. I like that. Okay, so let's break it down one by one. First one is your purchasing. Of course, purchasing too much is usually a problem. Purchasing for too high of a cost, that's the only thing that's really out of your control if you don't measure, monitor, and ask about it. Okay, no detailed specifications when you're buying detailed specs for purchasing, like uh, just send me some ribeyes. Well, you didn't say what kind of ribeyes, what type of ribeyes you want, especially when we get into other subprimal cuts. We got like zero by ones, one by ones on New York's. So we got all different kinds of grades of stuff. Okay, no purchasing budget. Who here has a purchasing budget? Two people. You should have a budget. You gotta have a purchasing budget. Every week you should be doing projections. Like next week, let's say, uh, I'm just gonna use an example. Next week my sales, I'm projecting 10 grand for next week. If I wanna hit an average 30% food cost, if I can only spend 30%, that's $3,000. I tell my chef, my culinary team, hey guys, you got $3,000 to spend next week. That's all you got. You know, that's all you got. It's just like your personal budget. I mean, what happens when you're out of money? What do you do? Call mom. Call mom. <laughs> no, Zach. Credit, Credit yeah. All right. But see, here's what happens. When your team gets used to spending more than their means or spending more of your money than they're used to or told to, they just expect you to pay it. Oh, don't worry about it. Jennifer's got tons of money. Oh, don't worry. Candy will pay for it. No, oh, don't worry. We'll go over it. It's fine. No, hold them accountable. I'm curious because I've heard you say this multiple times now. In today's world, to me, that seems impossible. What? Because last week, bacon was $65 a case. Mm -hmm. And this week, it's $80 a case mm -hmm. up in, you know, where I'm from. And that goes for everything I buy right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, every week, it's a different price. <clears throat> 20 bucks higher or 10 bucks less? Or, so how do you do a budget? I still do a budget. I just, I just have to, so understanding my what I pay for is only one aspect of the element. Understanding my menu, understanding where I'm using ingredients across the board is another element, and understanding if I need to substitute items or change items on my menu as I go is another option. All right, just because you have a menu that has 20 things on there that have bacon doesn't mean you have to have bacon on everything. You can easily change the menu. You, everyone here is an independent restaurant. You're not a chain, right? I mean, you have free will on whatever you put on the menu, take off the menu. You can do it the hell you want. Just because bacon goes up doesn't mean I have to play the game. I could actually change some stuff around. I remember there was a time, I remember, remember like last year when avocados went through the roof? Oh, yeah, 100 bucks a case. 100 bucks a case. There's times when limes went through the roof. You know, a lot of places like started just changing their stuff. Like bacon's an upchart. You know, instead of having a bacon normally on a burger, I might take that burger off the menu. Like have, not having my bacon cheeseburger on it, but someone comes in and says, well, I don't want to have bacon on my burger. Sure, but let, just let you know there is an upcharge for it because of the, the rise in, you know, pricing. And just tell people up front. You still like bacon? That's fine. It's, it's $4 upcharge. I love bacon. Sure. Sounds cool to me. I'm cool. Especially if I know you knew you use really good bacon. I know Brian uses really good bacon, right? Nothing wrong with changing. If you don't like the way the game is played, change it, right? If you cannot control the prices of commodities, I cannot control food costs jumping up and down. I cannot cost bacon jumping up, you know, 50, 60 bucks a case in a week. I can't control that. What I can control is on my end. All right, what are we going to do about this, guys? That's where I should be having you know, leadership teams, you know, meetings with my team and saying, hey, this is jumping up, what do we wanna do? And give me productive, positive re responses. Remember, every time I'm working for solutions, I'm always asking for three. If they say, well, we can do this or do that, that's a dilemma, I, I hate dilemmas. Give me three. At three, I always have choice, and trust me, there's always three. 
you always have three options. Sometimes you might have to do some, brain, you know, some brainstorming and searching. There's always three options. Two is choice. I mean, two is dilemma. Three is choice. Always want to get the choice. Hashtag. Always get the choice. Always work, it, always work the problem until you get three solutions and then brainstorm and figure out which one's the best one for your option, for you, okay? All right. Purchasing too much means you're not setting up PARs. You don't have PAR systems. They're not doing a physical inventory. This is the lazy chef or kitchen manager sitting in the office, you know, not managing his time properly. Most people don't manage their time properly. It's the, the deadline for my call in for my orders, two o'clock, it's 1.50. Fuck, he's scrambling around. He's on the phone. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, just read down the order guide and I'll tell you what I need. Uh, your bacon, yeah, uh, yeah, bacon, yeah, send me a case. Uh, tomatoes, uh, send me two. He, he's still got two in the cooler, but he's just making shit up on the fly because he thinks he knows. Trust me, no one can remember what the fuck's everything is in your inventory. I don't give a shit how good you are, unless you got a photographic memory. Even then, that's crazy. I mean, shit gets used all the time. Yes. Hashtag write that down what Liz has said. Always, and not to make you sound creepy or anything, touch your product. Not in a weird way. Not in a weird way, not in a creepy way, but touch your product. I used to put on all my order guides at the very bottom, touch your product, big bold letters, touch your product. What that means is I go into the inventory, into the shelves, I actually open, I look at the box, I pull the box, I shake it, I look inside. Not just go in and see two boxes of tomatoes and thinking they're full. Because what happens? People grab a case, they start prepping out of it, they leave like three tomatoes in there, they put the box back up. Someone else comes in, grab the other box, use some of them. Now I think I got two full cases, but there's only actually six tomatoes in there. And then I was like, hey, somebody needs to run the store, get tomatoes. Wait, we had two cases. Oh, well, they weren't full. <laughs> Touch your products. That's where you get number one. Purchasing too much. If you're not using a order guide system with a par level and ordering to par, you're getting self killed. And the only person who should change the par is either someone in the leadership team or the owner. No one at a, a, you know, a normal rate, you know, the line cooks and the prep cooks should not be able to change pars without consulting someone. Okay. <clears throat> No purchasing budget. Everyone's going to have a purchasing budget. No audit of invoices and payments. Candy, is that a big no-no? Always like, yeah. Always double check. Because I'm telling you, they're like you. They're busy. Especially a lot of times when drivers drop off stuff and you want a credit. Oh, hey, this was damaged. Can I get a half? Can I get a credit on a case? Oh, I want to send this back. It was the wrong product. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. They write it down and then they forget, right? Because they're dropping off 30 trucks or 30, you know, 30 stops that day. And things just get lost sometimes. Make sure you always inspect what you expect. Yes? Do not let the truck drivers hold you hostage. Oh, I got 10 more stops. I don't care. I don't care. Wait until I'm done weighing every single freaking steak that came into this. Exactly. <clears throat> we'll talk about it in receiving. How do you guys feel about dark drops? Does our orders come in often on days that we're closed? Yeah. Dark drops are fine, but again, I'm going to inspect it as soon as I get in. The first thing I do is I'm going to inspect it and I'm going to call right away. Okay. You're going to have more credit issues with dark drops, but you, and you got to have some system to keep track of it. So I would take photos. I take photos of the product. I take photos of the label. I take photos of the invoice and I send them to my sales rep immediately as soon as they happen. And then I put a note on my calendar, follow up on credit from Monday delivery on Thursday. I set a reminder for myself because I know, like, I know how you get. You get busy and you forget. No. Yes, I know. Cora, get busy and forget. Never. Everyone gets busy and forgets. I forget too. If I don't put reminders on my phone, I forget shit. I'm like, the worst thing in the world is I get a reminder from AT&T that my phone bill's passed due. I'm like, oh shit. All right, yeah. I should just set up on auto pay. I just always forget to set up on auto pay too. Too many vendors. Bo talked about this. There's a cost for every time you write, and every time you do an order, every time you have a, a vendor, there's a cost to that. Having too many vendors is costing you. You want to kind of streamline it down. I'm like Bo, I believe in two. I should have a primary vendor and I have at least one backup. Okay, that's usually my deal. I usually have a primary vendor and I have a backup vendor. 
and I let them all both know. They do. They do. I let them, you know, be honest. You know, transparency is huge. Well, if one of your core values is, tra it get, here's the thing also too about core values. Core values just don't apply to your restaurant. It should be how you run your business. If you have integrity, communication, respect as your core values, that should be with everyone you interact with. Not just your team, not just the way you want your team to act to your guests, not just your guests. It should be everybody you're involved with. That should go down to your, I mean, your core values, should, especially since they generate from you, from your personal life, they should be a representation of who you are as a person in the world. I don't know if I ever mentioned that, but that's just the way we should always conduct our business with anybody is acting in congruency with our core values. Got it. Receiving. Chef mentioned this right here. You know, theft by receiving personnel. And it's not that my team, I, I, again, I trust my team, but I always just double check stuff. I remember one time I was working as, I was hired as a consultant for a big hotel. I was the corporate, I was like a corporate chef for at the time. This is back before I opened my own restaurant. I was doing some chef consulting stuff. And I noticed like, shit, man, we use a lot of shrimp. God damn. Seems like, man, I buy a case of shrimp and I'm always, I'm buying like a case of shrimp every other day almost. So then I got kind of curious and I like came in and I noticed like they had one of the dishwashers putting the order away. He was putting the order away. I just kind of sat back and I, I didn't want like, well, I wasn't hovering on top of him, but I kind of stayed back and I noticed he was, you know, putting some stuff away. He went over, grabbed a trash bag, went back in the receiving area. Then a couple minutes later, he took a small, small bag. You know, most trash cans, or most bags in kitchens are full, right? He had a small, small bag of trash tied up really nice. Went out to the dumpster, threw it in the dumpster. I was like, shit. Was something damaged? You know, shit, I should check that. I should make sure it's not, you know, like maybe it's something leaking or something like that. I want to get credit, right? So I go out and do some, I do some dumpster diving, get in there, pull the thing out, open it up, two boxes, 1620 shrimp, frozen. He had been throwing him in a garbage bag, throwing him in the trash can, then telling his family to come pick him up. He was having a little shrimp fiesta on my dime, right? Yeah. Again, remember, inspect what you expect. Now, does that mean everybody does that? No, of course not. I've also seen this too, where receiving personnel could be like sometimes the driver. I've worked for restaurants where we order pre-cut steaks. Maybe I don't have a team that's very experienced in cutting or you know, fabricating meats. So maybe I'm buying pre-cut steaks, and I've seen this before. So I'm ordering New York strips. And I also notice there's 14 in a box. The box comes in. Most time the box comes in a pre-cut steaks. Thank you. You sign off, you take the box, you throw it on the shelf and the team just goes at it. The team should also receive it and check it and double count it. So I'm looking through the box. Hmm. 12. It's supposed to be 14. It says in the box, 14. 14 12 ounces. Hmm. I look at the other box. 14 12 ounces. Count. 1 2 3 4 5. 12. Found out the driver was taking one or two steaks out of pre-cut boxes on his route to finance his little summer barbecue he had. <laughs> yeah. Guy had a nice little stash of like T-bones, ribeyes, New York's top sirloins, flat irons. He had a nice little, little stash going. Okay. Again, it's not that I expect everyone to be dishonest, but I'm just inspecting what I expect. If I don't check it, I don't know. Yeah, that's it. Trust, verify. No system for credits. You got to have a system for credits. Make sure you're always following up with your vendors about your credits. When am I getting my credits? How are my credits coming back? When are we going to see this on my account? Right? Ask questions. No system for checking in orders. Again, you got to have some kind of standardized procedure for checking in. Like Omar mentioned, do not let the driver rush you. So many times they'll, just, you know, and they're in a rush. I mean, they got 40 stops and they got the big, you know, pa you know, dolly of stuff and they, rolling it in or pulling the dolly and they throw you the invoice here sign this i gotta get going uh-uh i don't work for you you work for me you're you know you're my vendor you work for me i'm gonna do my thing like i normally do i'm gonna take my time i'm gonna check my quality check my product make sure i have the right item and the right portions right temperature too and then i'll be happy to sign it but do not let the driver rush you 
All it takes is one or two times training them, and trust me, they stop. They do it to personnel they don't know, they don't know any better. And a lot of times they'll do it with personnel, like they'll just like, if you're not in the kitchen or have somebody responsible in the kitchen, they'll just like drop it off and go to like the, usually the person they can get to right away, which is usually the dishwasher. Double check that all your invoices are signed by a leadership team member, if possible. Now maybe some scheduling, you might not be able to have that all the time, but it should be some, somebody on the leadership team that's responsible should be, or should have signing authority. Like if you have a morning prep cook who's like your opening guy that you trust to open, he should also be kind of trustworthy to sign stuff, but also teach him your policy for receiving orders so he knows exactly. Don't rush it, go through everything, count everything, check everything. Once it's all verified, then you're authorized to sell, to sign it. But don't let him get rushed either. We talked about the other day, remember we talked about job behavioral profiles? Most people who are good prep cooks are usually what we call high pace. High pace don't like conflict. So when that driver's in your face, hey, sign this, man, I gotta get going. Okay, they, they just do it. They don't want conflict. Just tell them though, hey, part of your job is just be cool and calm and just like say, listen, All right? And if the driver's really insistent about it and the, and the person who's there receiving feels pressured, you need to have a talk with your salesperson to have a talk with the driver. Or I'm at the restaurant the next time the truck comes in and I have a little one-on-one -on -one in the walk-in. Hey, can we talk real quick? I always talk in a walk-in. You know why? It's soundproof. That's why. You know why? You know why? There are no cameras in the walk-in. No cameras. And it's soundproof. Let's go talk in a walk-in. See, there's no crying in the kitchen. You go cry in a walk-in. Go cry in a walk-in. Yeah. No, yeah, or worse, or worse. I've walked into that before. I was like, oh my God. I could tell you a really horrifying story about a celebrity. I did some consulting with one of his restaurants and this is how I met the celebrity. <laughs> I was like doing a walk and I walked in and opened a walk in cooler. Whoa. Love your stuff. <laughs> Love your work. Yeah. Nice. Whoa. <laughs> it's like, damn. Never look at your movies the same way again. <laughs> okay. And I don't think that's your wife. <laughs> okay. Let's just keep going. Perishable items left out of proper storage. Remember this. A lot of times you spend a lot of money on produce. Every hour that produce sits out at room temperature, not refrigerated, you lose a half a day of shelf life. So you just got that lettuce in, that romaine just came in. Guy dropped it off, eight o'clock, guys are busy prepping. Got dropped off at eight o'clock, nine, 10, 11, three hours it waits before someone puts it away. How much shelf life did you lose? Yeah. Day and a half. And then we wonder like, shit, man, it seems like I'm blowing through produce really fast. A lot of that's preventable if your team just gets on putting that shit away as soon as it comes in. Do not leave shit sitting out. <coughs> that's the number one thing I see. Order comes in, and I've seen this before, as I, you know, I walk in the back door and there's an order stacked up by the walk-in. Hey, what? Time to get, oh, they got dropped off a couple hours ago. <laughs> That's a priority. It's like hot food to me. Hot food, hot, cold food, cold. Order is a priority. Put that product away, right away. Another thing, storage again. Food stored improperly. Food improperly in storage place. Storage at the wrong temperature and humidity. Double check your coolers all the time. There's certain things in your cooler that need certain temperature zones and if you have a pretty big walk-in your walk-in has different temperature zones not everything's at that same 35 degrees all through the thing it's like different temperature zone closer to the fan has a different temperature zone higher shelves have a different temperature zone than lower shelves you got to understand what is the best place and I actually have charts for these things and I can actually upload them to the members area they're really really great no daily inspection of your dry goods or your store goods every day someone should walk the cooler one of the things that coaching does is, and I talk about this a lot, is coaching is about creating new habits. If your team doesn't have a habit, 
of checking the walk-ins, walking the, walking the storage system, you want to start setting reminders for them. If I have a new kitchen manager who doesn't have a lot of experience, which I love because I can train him the way I want him to, what I do is I set alarms on his phone. 9 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 4 o'clock. When the alarm goes off on the phone, it says, walk the coolers. It's pretty easy. And then I know his phone goes off at 9, 11, 2, and 4. So what do you think I'm doing? I'm inspecting what I expect. I'm walking back there around 2 o'clock, because I know his alarm went off, and I'm seeing, is he walking around checking the coolers? If he does, he gets appreciation. Number five on the daily five. If he doesn't, he gets number four, standards and expectations. It's very, very critical that we walk the coolers to you know, ensure that everything's running right. Also make sure that we're in, uh, on the zone for production. I need you to make sure you're committed to doing this. Are you with me on this? Yes, perfect. Let's make sure we follow the schedule. Okay. Unorganized storage areas. Oh yeah. You wanna make sure everything's nice, neat, organized. One of the things I love to do is I put, I'm, I wouldn't say I'm OCD. I love labels though. I will put little tags and labels on everything. So everything, everybody knows where everything goes. Bucatini goes here, Parpadelli goes here, Farfelli goes here, olive oil goes here. I put everything on the shelves with tags so everybody knows where everything goes. I do it also in the walk-in too, I'm kind of anal about it. Unsalted butter goes here, heavy whipping cream goes here. It makes, inventory order. makes everything so easy. Remember, inspect what you expect, but help them out by helping them organize. Hey guys, what we're gonna do is we're gonna, we're gonna basically radically organize all our storage areas. We're gonna get little tags and put everything out. Should we not call it idiot proofing? I wouldn't call it idiot proofing. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. no. Yeah. yeah. But you wanna organize everything. Take some time, I'm telling you, if you take some time on the front end, it makes the back end easier about you know, managing inventory, managing production, just makes your life easy. Is it a little work in the front? Yeah. Is it worth it? Oh, hell yeah. You know? And then at times, there'll be times when you walk in, even though, and even though you got stuff labeled, heavy cream goes here, you're gonna walk in, there's gonna be a, ha a gallon of milk sitting there. Like someone just got lazy and just put it there by mistake because they were just in a rush. Guys, hey. Milk goes over here. That's for heavy cream, that's for whole milk. It was heavy, yeah, it was heavy. It was, it was heavy milk, no, that's not heavy cream, so. What was that yesterday where he was talking about systems that he does and that he does are there to make it easier for him in the long run? for them. Everybody, people are. Most people are lazy. Yeah, makes it easier for everybody. And I'm telling you, the systems you set up transfer to any concept. I have people that have one concept multiple times. I have some people have five, six different concepts. The beautiful thing about everything I teach is that the concepts, the systems work in any concept. Whether you're a burger place, pizza place, you know, sushi place, doesn't matter. Organization's organization. You can transfer these systems, the same thing. Wolfgang Puck had the same way. We had Chinois in Maine, we had Wolfgang Puck Bar and Grill, we had Cut Steakhouse, we had, uh, we had Spagos, we had everything, but the systems were all the same. Only thing, and I think Bo and I think those guys talked about, it, all I had to learn was just the menu. He could plug, I could take, we could take any chef from any Wolfgang Puck concept, put him into another concept, and it'd be up and running in a week. All they had to learn was the menu. How you process a recipe was the same no matter where you went. You got the recipe card, you put it in front of you, you grabbed all your mise en place, you measured everything out. We all had the same process for everything we did. We all had the same process how we did recipes. We all had the same process how we did production. We all had the same process for ordering. We had the same process for inventory. Hey, the same process for production. You could take any chef from any location, plug them in. It was beautiful because the systems were the same. Didn't matter. Remember we talk about the 3P framework, people, product, process. People feed the process, process feeds the people. When you work on that process part and have it so nailed down that they can't make a mistake, 
not idiot proof, but it's, it's basically unfallible <laughs> or bulletproof in another way I like to do. I like, I like to tell people like, I want to make it bulletproof. <laughs> yeah, let's make it bulletproof so we're all good, always, all the time. Make it bulletproof and then when you have the right people in place, that system works over and over a place. It's a, it's a beautiful thing once you get it dialed in. Does it take some work on the front end? Yeah, of course. But anything worthwhile takes a little bit of work. No single, uh, lack of single responsibility for food storage. Somebody's got to be in charge. If it's everyone's responsibility, no one has accountability. I always have one person accountable at all times. One person's my go-to. Always has to be that way. Okay. No control or record of food issues. Uh, from storeroom. Again, sometimes things fall, things break. I'm back in the dry storage room, I'm reaching for a bottle of vinegar and I, I and accidentally hit a bottle of olive oil, it's glass, and it breaks in the floor. Most of the time that stuff just goes in the trash no one knows it happened. There should be some record, some kind of waste log available for the team and they have to understand, I just want to know what happens to it. You're not in trouble, waste logs are never a punishment, they're a training tool. So, let's use that for an example. I got vinegar on the top shelf that we use a lot for production, but I also have these glass bottle olive oils on the top shelf too. I've noticed that during the month, I've broken four bottles of olive oil. Hmm, what's the training opportunity here? Move the, Move the fucking olive oil, <laughs> exactly it. If they keep reaching up and knocking over a bottle of glass olive oil, you know, I should probably move the glass stuff on the bottom shelf. Training opportunity, everything's an opportunity. Remember, sometimes it's just simple observation. When you see threads or trends in your waste logs, that's something to work on. I've seen this before too, and it's pretty common. I walk in the kitchen and I walk in the back door and there's a, like, a tray or two of bacon burned beyond recognition. What happened? Oh, I just forgot. Okay, cool. Next day I come in, another tray of bacon burned. Hey, what happened? Oh, I just forgot. Oh, training opportunity, what should I do? Either you send them a timer, buy them timers, or tell them to use their phone. Most guys in the kitchen have their damn smartphone. They're usually listening to rap music anyway. Nothing against rap music if you like that kind of stuff. You know, I like a little Jay-Z. You know? But just tell them, hey, use a timer, dude. All right? You don't have to remember everything. All right? Use timers. Most of the time, I'll buy those, you know, those little hand-wound-up things. Right? <laughs> remember the old, the old ones? You know, now they got the digital ones you know, that you can set. My father, this is to tell you what kind of tyrant my father was. If you burn something in the oven, and we had those old fashioned timers, and you burn something in the oven, did not use a timer, he got one of those timers, he had one specially done with a rope around it that you wore around your neck. Oh my God. And you wore it all day. Flava Flav in old school. I mean, back in the 70s, I think maybe, my, maybe Flava Flav worked for my dad, and that's where he got the idea. But you wore this damn timer around your neck all day. The other thing my father would do to embarrass you, to get you to comply, not com commitment, but compliance, is if you have your station dirty, he would have you chant out loud until he got tired of hearing it, clean as you go, 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 clean as you go. Can you imagine working in a kitchen and there's one guy who's an idiot, I'm going to use the word idiot, some guy who's like a moron can't keep his station clean and all he's doing is standing in a corner chanting for an hour. Clean as you go, clean as you go. You're like, oh my God. <laughs> you want to talk about how this is, this is like the power of peer pressure. People start working to help him keep his station clean. Go, Dude, I do not want to hear you chanting that shit another day. Dude, let me help you, let me, let me help you out, brother. Let's put your meats like this. You want to put a towel here, put your, you know, put your tools right here, keep your sanitation bucket right there. Every time you use it, clean this thing. Please, please, I'm begging you, please. If you can't do it, come get me. I'll clean it for you. It, it's going to hurt me more than it hurts you, kind of, yeah. I mean, you're sitting there in a kitchen, one guy just chanting over and over for an hour. Monot in a monotonous tone like that, too. Clean as you go, clean as you go. It was like, red rum, red rum, red rum, red rum, red rum, red rum. He's like, oh shit. I think there was one time I was just like, 
<laughs> it won't hurt that much, <laughs> you know. <laughs> it won't hurt that bad. It'll be over soon. That was yeah. When he told me like, you know, it's in your blood. I'm like, fuck this. I want a transfusion. I'm out. Preparation. Another huge area of food cost waste, food cost thieves is production. Preparation. Excessive trim on vegetables and meats. Not checking the raw yield. No secondary usage of items. Bo mentioned this too. If you only have one item that you bring in just for one dish, that's a waste. I remember a place like I walked in the cooler. I don't know if everybody, there's like different types of microgreens. Some microgreens have longer shelf life than others. Some microgreens like bull's blood don't last that long. You know, like a day or two. This guy had, he was a chef. He wanted bull's blood on top of his tuna tartare tower. Now they didn't sell a lot of tuna tartare towers. So we did not use a lot of bull's blood. And every day I'd look in the trash can and there'd be two or three little receptacles of bull's blood that were wasted. And at, what, like 20 bucks a pop? Not cheap. At 20 bucks a pop, I started to do the math. That's 20, 40, 60, 80, 100, I mean, like almost like 200 bucks a week just in thrown away microgreens. So we quickly said, chef, what can we do different as a garnish? Well, I really like the red microgreens. What can we do that's red that might be a cool garnish that we could put on top? Hmm, I don't know. Hmm, how about beet threads? Why don't we get some raw beets and we, you know, we put them through one of those spiral slicers, we make some beet threads, we put them in a little cornstarch, we fry them up, and we have this nice little crispy tower we can put on top. Actually, we give it a little more height than the bull's blood. I like that idea. So do I because we already have beets on the menu because we have a beet salad. <laughs> Perfect solution. You know? At first he fought it a little bit, but I want bull's blood. But Jeff, we're throwing away like 100, 200 bucks a week. But I want bull's blood. Jeff, work with me here. Yeah, work with me here, man, work with me. Excessive trim on vegetables means most of the time if the guys aren't trained properly, <clears throat> and this is how my, again, my father, I hate to use my father. Sorry, dad. Well, actually, sorry, dad. <laughs> <laughs> my father, like you're cutting zucchini, like, you know, there's a, there's a stem end and there's the end of the, of the zucchini. When you cut off the ends, he would come by and inspect how much end of the zucchini you cut off. If it was more than like a, the size, the more of the, si the thickness of a quarter, you were in trouble. Yeah. Food waste. Food waste. The funniest thing you'll see now is like, I am so accurate. Like my, my girlfriend freaks out, like I'm doing zucchini at the house and I just pull the zucchini out and take my knife and whoosh, like that real quick. And I leave like that much off the edge. She goes, wow, how'd you do that? I go, that's like five years of hell. Muscle memory. <laughs> I never forget that. It's like, every time. Yeah, you get that kind of muscle memory. You never forget. Preparation is huge. Production is the next biggest one. Production. Overproduction. Hashtag, write this down. Do not let your team decide how much to prep. You should be telling them how much to prep. Or someone on your culinary team who's in charge should be telling them how much to prep. Every time I've ever gone into a kitchen, I'll ask it every time I've done this. You guys set up for lunch? Yeah, yeah, we're ready, we're ready. All right, awesome, let's go. Hour into lunch. 86 this, 86 that. Hey, what happened? I thought you guys said we had, I thought you said you were set, we had plenty. I thought, I thought I had enough. Yeah, well, there you go. Eliminate the thinking for your team. <laughs> you want to do the thinking for them. Tell them, I want 12 quarts of marinara. Because here's another thing too, people are creatures of habit. I'm a prep cook. I've been with your restaurant for, I'm a, it's an Italian restaurant. I've been with your restaurant for four years. Every Monday I come in and I make 10 gallons of marinara sauce. I make 300 meatballs. I, may, I shred 50 pounds of mozzarella every Monday. I've been doing this for four years. Business kind of drops off. I don't really know. What do you think I make on Monday? Same amount. Same amount. Same amount. Same amount. 
And all of a sudden it's like, wow, you know, we got a lot of meatballs. Shit, we got a lot of cheese. Some of this cheese is going moldy, you know, because our volume dropped down a little bit because we're in between summer and winter. No one adjusted the pars. No one told them to cut back on production. People are creatures of habit. They do the same thing all the time. You have to tell them, hey, guys, we're going into a slower period. We need to cut back a little bit. Now, you might be saying, well, Donald, what if I tell them to cut back and we get slammed? Which you probably could. Then you readjust your par. There's nothing wrong with 86ing an item also. Just because you have a full menu doesn't mean you have to have everything on the menu all the time. It's okay to say, we're going to have to 86 this for tonight, not run it tonight. Okay? How do you feel about, this is something my dad and I used to get into at his restaurant, and now I can still get into it to this day. When I set my pars, let's say they're, they're using the wrong label for a sauce on the dish. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, they're out of the fucking sauce. And so I'm like, all right, 86 the dish. Mm -hmm. and my dad will come in. But we still have 30 servings of chicken, but we don't have the sauce, so we're 86ing it. Yeah. But we'll just serve it with this sauce instead. Mm -hmm. I'm like, no, that's not my fucking dish. <laughs> and then I'll leave the kitchen, and I come back 15 minutes later, and I'm serving it the wrong sauce. Yeah. I'm just going to say, it's not negotiable. It's not negotiable. I appreciate your input, Father. I really do, but it's not negotiable. And it's not consistent. And it's not consistent. I always got to think about, remember, here's the thing you want to remember too. The ends do not justify the means sometimes, especially when it comes to keeping my brand integrity. Brand integrity above everything else. Keeping your brand intact. And the lack of brand integrity is the number one thing that kills, kills restaurants, number one. Have you ever heard of brand dilution? Brand dilution is a common phenomenon. Brand dilution is this. And this is, I see it all the time because I've worked thousands and thousands of restaurants. You start off with your restaurant concept. It's great. You launch, you open up, everyone loves it. The place is packed. All of a sudden, just like everything else in life, there's a cycle of business. And it starts declining, right? What happens when your business starts declining? What do you do? Fuck. You panic, right? Oh my God. What did we do? What did we do wrong? Oh my God, business is dropping. What did we do? You didn't do anything. It's just a natural cycle of business, people. You have to understand everything in life has ebbs and flows. And so does the cycle of your business. Even if you're the most popular place in the world, you will have a slower time. It's just natural. Now, when you hit that ebb and it comes down, two things happen. You can either just ride it through, which it will eventually self-correct and eventually you'll go back up. Or you can do what you should be doing a long time ago. It shouldn't be constantly marketing anyway. Because most, most people do is when it's really busy, they don't mark it. And then they wonder why it's not busy when it's starting to slow down. They start slowing down. They think it's something they did with their food or service, but it's not. It's just not you're keeping your brand top of mind with marketing, which it should always be. It should always be marketing, always be recruiting. Okay? Always be what? Always what? Always be training, right? That's, I got three things I say, uh, tell everyone always be. Always be training, always be marketing, always be recruiting. The three A's. Always, always, always. Those three. So if I'm not telling people to adjust my parts, and this is what happens to brand dilution. So the brand starts slopping down. They don't, have any, they don't have anybody to help guide them, so they don't understand the ebbs and flows. So they panic. So they start adding new stuff to the menu. Oh my God, what if we... And then, of course, you get that friend. You know what you need? You need a pizza. People love pizza. <laughs> Shit, you're right. Even though we're a high-end burger place, a pizza sounds like a good fucking idea. Okay, that sounds good. So then you put pizza on the menu. Now you get some sales because you market it a little bit. You know, you get some sales. People, oh my God, we're back up. We're back up. We're doing great again. But then again, it starts ebbing down again. And then your friend says, you know what you need? Greek food. People love a fucking euro. God damn, you're right. Fucking everyone loves euros. God damn. I need a euro. So you put a euro on the menu. Sales go back up. And it's just to keep doing this thing up and down, up and down. But then the problem is, is now your menu is a hodgepodge of burgers and pizzas and euros. And now you do Italian night on Friday nights. And I got pastas. Now you, oh, now you're going to, you decide to do a couple high end steaks too. Now you're just a kind of a barrage of all kinds of stuff. And now you lose what is known as brand identity. The guests don't even know who you are anymore. And what happens when the guest is not sure who you are? They just stop coming. 
I had a place like that in, in, in Albuquerque. It was probably one of my first consulting jobs in uh, Albuquerque. It was in 2009. And the place was a really, really famous, it had been around since the 70s, a long time. The menu had become a hodgepodge. There was like Greek food, there was Mexican food, there was steaks, there was pizzas, there was all kinds of stuff on there. And I said, wait, what? tell me your story, tell me your backstory. Oh, we started out, you know, uh, there was no, everything was Mexican in the area. And so we decided, you know, we wanted to do a steakhouse. So we were like the original Old Town Steakhouse. I'm like, duh. <laughs> Let's just go back to being the original Old Town Steakhouse. And that was actually the tagline I came up with. The original Old Town Steakhouse. It wasn't rock science. So we can dumped all the stuff out of the way. We dumped all the old crap out of the way. Got rid of all the Greek food, all the really crazy shit. We started doing our own kind of contemporary steakhouse kind of thing. And then what happened was we marketed it properly. The sales took off their roof. Yeah. Brand dilution is real and it happens every day. And you don't know what's happening because you're just trying to keep your business alive. And I understand that. When you're trying to protect something, you, you do throw everything at you can. You try to keep it going. You want to keep it on, you know, it might be on life support, but you're going to keep it going no matter what. Sometimes you got to change the model and you got to get just real basic with it. Wrong method of cooking. I've seen this before too. Chef can tell you too. Certain things that are great for yield, some cooking methods will like just kill stuff. You know, chicken, a lot of fish. You know, I've seen braised stuff. I've seen roasted stuff. There's lots of different cooking methods. You gotta make sure you're using the right cooking method for your menus. Cooking at the incorrect temperatures. Again, I tell all my line cooks this, just because it goes up on high doesn't mean you have to cook it on high. <laughs> Everyone wants to take that goddamn saute pan, <laughs> crank that flame up and then, oh, oh shit, it's burning. You know, you know what the difference between smoke point and flash point is? About two seconds. Goes from smoke and all of a sudden, whoa, she boosts into flames. And then that's usually like my first lesson for guys. It's like, and I can see it happen. I'm like, it's going gonna, it's gonna to burst into flames. And he, oh, there it goes. <laughs> you know, I just try to warn him, right? How long? From smoke point to flash point? Instantly. Instantly. It's like two seconds, seriously. And I can see a guy when he's got his pan on, he's got his oil in there, and I see it start smoking. I'm like, Yep, that's gonna be a poof in a second. And you'll know you have a problem with that. Ask your dishwasher if his pans are always coming with like burnt on burnt shit, shit at, the at the bottom. Yeah, he's not happy. He's not happy. Yeah. And what, what's the number one thing they do when they do it? Grab the pan, just throw it in the bus tub real quick, right? And they usually melt the bus tub because the pan's smoking hot, and they throw it in the bus tub, smoking hot, and it melts the bus tub. I can always like I can always tell who's like working by when I walk the line and I look in the in the bus tub on the line and I see the, the pans. Do you guys put your hot pans into buckets of water? No. No. It warps your pans. Yeah, why would you do that? <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey Cora. Hey Cora. Cora, you know if you stick a knife in a light socket, you'll kill yourself. <laughs> Do you think so? You want to try it? <laughs> Stop putting your pans in water. One of my chefs told me to do that. Yeah, one of your chefs. He's awesome. Yeah, he's special. He has a bakery? That's where he belongs. He has a bakery? He's not anymore. <laughs> here's, oh, here's the, the number, number five and number six, the biggest one. No food production schedule. Oh, let's go back to number four. Cooking or holding products for too long of a time period. I see this also. The guys in the line, a lot of times they tend to be lazy. You got maybe a mashed potato or some rice on a steam table that you're using as a pickup, right? Pickup station, you got mashed potatoes, rice. What do they do? They get the biggest freaking pan they can, the six inch half pan, and they fill that sucker up and then they mound it on top. Cause I don't want to stop and reload potatoes during dinner. That'd be stupid, right? What happens? They're scooping off the top, the cold potatoes, the stuff in the bottom is getting burnt, overcooked. Now the starch is all leaching out. Now it becomes like soup in the bottom. So when they finally start stirring up all that stuff, all that bad potatoes now in your good potato, and people are like, you know, the potatoes, do they, say, they taste burnt to you? I don't know, they taste burnt. 
And then you know, the manager comes, how's everything? It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> One star review, potatoes tanks like they were burnt shit, you know? <laughs> Keep your stuff fresh, right? Holding stuff too long. Do not, I, I'm gonna tell you right now, hashtag write this down. Most restaurants operate for what's easiest for the team, not what's best for the guest. Change that dynamic. Do what's best for the guest, not what's easiest for the team. How many people are open at, what's your hours for opening till? What do you open till? Till 10 o'clock at night? What time do you serve restaurant to people too? 9.45? Yeah. My rule was always this. I'm open till 9. I was open at 9 till 9 p.m. If you came in at 9 p.m., you got sat. You got full service. Just like you were just came at 5 o'clock. We never cut corners. I don't care. How many times have people on, I've seen people on the team come in at 9 o'clock. And I think Bo talked about this or, or Kelly talked about this. And they were like, oh, shit, another table. Oh, my God. But you, you stopped your reservations. That's not my reservations early, yeah. But if someone walks in at 9 o'clock, I'm open until 9 o'clock. It says 9 o'clock. You come in at 9 o'clock, I'm actually, if you walk in at 9.02, I'll still give you the full service. Still doing it, man. I'm still doing it, man. I'm open. I used to, when my team first got upset about that, I said, you know what? You guys getting upset about people coming in at, at close to order food is like being a shoe salesman and someone could be, you're being pissed off if somebody want to come in and buy shoes. That's the stupidest thing in the world. That's how we make our money. Yeah. Yeah, you get more hours, you get everything. You gotta stop that. That's a cultural thing. And I usually tell them, hey, listen, man, I know I know that party you're going to later is gonna be off the hook, but it can wait and you'll still be there. And people, trust me, by the time you get there, everyone will be drunk, they'll think you're funny, it's gonna be better for you. The other thing is if it takes them an hour to close the kitchen, right? And then one table walks in just that close, seat that table, <coughs> serve them, guess what? You can close the rest of the kitchen. Yeah, yeah. Inventory down at all. So all you have left to do is just the line. Just the line. That's it. It's easy to do. They can help the kitchen close. At my restaurant, they do. What? When your friends come in? No, the, no, the front of house. Yeah. Sorry about oh, the front of house. Yeah. Yeah. She's like, what are you doing? Right. She's like, front of house. Here at that table. Um, it takes more than one person to close that door. I'm, I'm not gonna argue. It's good business practice, right? Yes, but when you're losing money and you have five people on and you have that one guest walk in, you know. Yeah, well, we gotta re we gotta reconfigure your your business model, that's all. <laughs> Look at a PM, right. No food production schedules. That's not having prep lists, production sheets. You gotta have a production sheet. I have all my members of all my coaching programs. You have to have a production sheet with PARs. And also, I tell you to put times on there too. Most people, again, I mentioned this quite a few times, they suck at time management. There's a thing in management theory called Parkinson's Law. Parkinson's Law is very simple. Work expansion or contracts meet time obligated. If Ryan's a prep cook for me and he's been doing the same job for years, Ryan comes in at eight o'clock every morning, he has a production sheet, he works till five o'clock, I give him an average of 10 items a day, Ryan will work from eight to five, and do the 10 items, because that's how he does. He works at a pace, his own pace. Everyone has their own internal clock. Now, let's say one day I have a huge catering that day, but I need everything done by two o'clock, and I go to Ryan, dude, I know it's the same workload, but I really need you to get on this today, and I really need it done by two o'clock, because I need the kitchen for a big, huge plate up. Ryan would jump on it, push a little harder, and get it done by two. What changed? The constraint of time. Just the constraint of time. Again, most people are shitty at managing their time. If you give them free will to manage their time, they're not gonna manage their time very well. Just look at the average person online uses what? Looks at their phone 150 times a day. They're on social media, what, TikTok for an hour a day. Average person watches TV for four hours a day. People suck at managing their own time. Yet, what's the number one thing? I'm so busy, I'm stressed out, I'm overwhelmed, I'm overworked, I'm stressed. No, you're not, you're just not managing your life. Time management is life management. Plain and simple. Time management is life management. Not, oh, this is my number one pet peeve, not using standardized recipes. <laughs> uh, 
That goes back to my chef days. You have to have a recipe. It has to be standardized. I've been working with a client for a while. We're still, and we haven't really talked to each other much because the last time we had a t I had a talk with him, I kind of <clears throat> went kind of bad chef on him, <laughs> kind of snapped. And I usually don't snap, but I kind of got to the point where I was just like, all right, I got to put the line in the sand hard. And I say, <clears throat> and I said, listen, I've been on you for seven months now to get standardized recipes. Do not fucking call me again until you have recipes done. Standardized recipes, you gotta have recipes. If you don't have standardized recipes in your restaurant, you are again, you're not in fucking business for a restaurant. It's just a free for all. Everyone wants to do the creative shit. Guys who wanna go in the kitchen, they wanna come in the kitchen because they wanna cook. I love that, I love that you wanna come and cook, but you gotta teach them a process too. There's a process to how we cook. No one makes anything in my restaurants without number one, writing a recipe. Because if I like it, I want to be able to duplicate it. And trust me, we've all done, Omar can attest to this, we've all done our fair share of, we're playing in the kitchen, getting creative, turns out really great, and all of a sudden, it's, oh shit, what did I do, right? <laughs> the Hail Mary, fuck, what was that? Oh my God, how much, was that coriander or cumin? Hmm. Is it a tablespoon or a teaspoon? Or a teaspoon, right? Yeah, we've all done that. Nowadays, I try to, especially if I'm going into test recipe development, I have a notepad next to me and I'm writing stuff down. I'm making adjustments, all right? Gotta have recipes. Who has recipes for everything in their restaurant? Written out, typed out, not written, not handwritten, scribble notes. And then I'm gonna ask you the other qualifying thing. I know Chef does. Can I have a written recipe? So it has to have the amount, has to have the process, how they put it together, and it also has to have a yield, how much that recipe makes. <clears throat> if you don't have yield, hold out your left hand, take your right hand. Bad owner. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm working on it. I'm working on it. No waste logs used. We talked about waste logs quite a few times already. Okay. Service. Again, no standard portion size. Portion. The, here, I'll tell you, of all the food cost killers, the 40 thieves, the, number, the three number one, waste, portion, and production. The number three. I'll look at the 40 thieves, I'll usually go through it check by check, but the first three I always look at is your waste, I look at your production, I look at your portioning. And Omar mentioned this. If you know you make a gallon of sauce, and it's supposed to be a six ounce ladle, how many ladles of sauce do you have for servings? If you're using a six ounce ladle into a gallon of sauce. I'm gonna use that Jeopardy theme. Twelve. What? Nine. Nine? It's a worse. Seventeen. Huh? All right. You can easily go to Google and you put in how many ounces in a gallon? How many ounces in a gallon? How many ounces in a gallon? One gallon? Isn't it like 120? Yeah, I was going to say, is it like 128? All right. There you go. So if you know you have a gallon, which you have to convert, number one, you have to convert, convert to ounces, which is 128 ounces. And if I have a six ounce ladle I'm using, I have how many? 21 portions of sauce, right? Now, it's supposed to be a six ounce ladle. I go back on the line and I see they're using an eight ounce ladle. Am I gonna blow through my sauce faster? Yeah. Oh, hell yeah. And that's usually where problems go wrong. If I don't have standard and specifications for how everything's supposed to be portioned and used, and I don't give them the right tools, and I've done this before, I'll walk back in the kitchen, hey guys, hey, it's supposed to be a, a six ounce ladle, how come you're using eight? Oh, we don't have any six ounce ladles. All right, that's owners. Guy, buy them some fucking six ounce ladles so they don't stop you know, using the eight ounce ladle. You know, so or... Six, six ounce ladles <clears throat> just sitting there dirty. Or six ounce ladles dirty. Or I've seen them like use the opposite too. Hey, it's a four ounce ladle. You guys know you have six ounce ladles. Oh, we do? Yeah, you do. Yeah. 
yeah, I just use one half. You know, I'm, I'm good at measuring. Anytime everyone says they're good at guessing, here's what I tell them. And I've had this actual, this actual conversation with an actual sous chef of mine. I walk in the back door of my restaurant. We had tenderloins. He's cutting tenderloins. He's trimming them up. And that's usually a high cost product that has a lot of waste usually. He's cutting the steaks. I go, where's the scale? He goes, I'm pretty good at guessing. I said, that's cool. You know, I'm good at guessing too. I'm going to guess your hours next week, okay? He's like, what? I go, yeah, what? You had 20, right? What? No, no. I said, hey, man, you mess with my money, I'm going to mess with your money. It's only fair, right? Working relations have to be win-win. <laughs> Scale on the table, plastic wrap, steaks. Every time I've ever walked in ever since then, scales on the table, weighing the steaks. Exactly. Whenever you're talking to your team, relate it into ways that they understand. Pain. <laughs> you know? What do we say? Pain versus pleasure? Hey, man, you're good at guessing? Yeah, that's cool, man. I'm good at guessing, too. What'd you work? Five hours last week? <laughs> what? You want to see someone's eyes open up like, what? Exactly. No standardized servings things. We just talked about that. Carelessness, spillage, waste, food, you know, cold food, stuff sitting out, room temperature too long. Got to monitor this stuff. Remember, inspect what you expect. And then the last one here, sales. Food taken out of the building. Unrecorded sales are incorrect pricing. The no charge or, you know, the cash not turned in. That's a, usually the no sale thing. That's usually at bars a lot. Guy comes up, buys a draft beer, it's for something. Gives you a five, bartender takes a five, hits no sale, pox a five. You lost a draft beer, he just made five bucks. If you're a busy bar, he does that 50 times a night, how much money do you think he just made? He made a lot of bank, right? Again, now he's your business partner, but he's not telling you he's a business partner. <laughs> and you're basically paying for the product, he's taking the profit. You're like, what the hell, man? How come my profit sucked? I can tell you exactly why. Yeah, you can give them no access to it. Yeah, you can restrict aspects for sure. Yeah. Another huge one, too, is uh, I think it's on here. Um, maybe it's not. Unrecorded sales. In incorrect pricing. Incorrect pricing is another one. A lot of times when I run people, I'll say, give me your product mix report. Let me see your P mix report. The number one thing I look at right away is your, your basically open food button. Every server, I don't know why, every server in the world, when they're charging something, it's always a buck. I don't know why. What was that for? Oh, that was for a crab cake. A dollar? <laughs> Open food, a dollar. It was, it was for bacon. That really expensive, uh, you know, neck, you know, that really expensive handcrafted bacon we buy? A dollar? Yeah, yeah. How much was that? What was that open food for? Oh, it's for avocado. The avocados I just paid $100 for a case? Chicken wings. It was a dollar. Me? No. I don't have an open food button. No. Yeah, you want to watch, you monitor your open food all the time because I'm telling you, they go in and just start ringing shit in all the time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, there's, wait, remember, remember, inspect what you expect. Yeah, Ryan will tell you from first-hand experience, he's in my accelerator program, one of the things we do is, you know, he has toast, I look at toast, and I, he has, I have access to his toast, and a lot of times I'm like, dude, what's this, what's this, what's this, he's like, oh, shit, here we go, <laughs> you know, but he asks questions, and you go ask this team, and then you know what, we stop the bleeding. Yeah, our big problem is voids. Voids and comps are huge. Different reasons as you want. Yeah. You got to also. Yeah, but a lot of people do, but only two staff members do it with their numbers. The trick is if someone else is snagging their numbers. Yeah. Another thing, like Ryan noticed too, is like he had some voids under his number. And he didn't 
and he like I was like, well, I didn't. Oh, yeah, yeah, the nights he was in the other restaurant, the restaurant upstairs was using voids for as he was there. It's like, dude, you've learned to clone yourself. That's pretty fucking cool. Yeah, it's really yeah. awesome. That's awesome, dude. He can stay home. He can work both <laughs> restaurants same time. His name pops up in the POS system all the time. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> big time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, you can't charge anything. Well, a lot of people do it. Yeah. A lot of people do it. You just, might, you just gotta watch it, yeah. <laughs> Here's another one too, and this, this goes back to production. No food popularity index or comparison of sales to inventory consumption. This is where I'm looking at my PAR sheets, and let's use that gallon of, mar I'm gonna say it's a gallon of marinara sauce. And I have what, 21 orders out of it, right? And let's say on an average night, I, we do 18 orders of marinara, but then it starts jumping up to, you know, I'm doing 30 orders of marinara a night. Is that one gallon of marinara gonna make it through a night? Of course not, now I got up my par, right? So a lot of times I wanna look at my menu and see what, and then also, this is where it gets crazy, let's say I have four dishes that use marinara. I got marinara on a meatball appetizer, I got a penne alla vodka that uses marinara with some cream. I got the meat, you know, a meatball and spaghetti dish. I also got a lasagna dish that uses marinara. Now I've got five dishes on my menu that use marinara at six ounces. Now I have to look at all my menu items and see what is my standard usage for every item that uses marinara sauce. Now I have to, that helps me calculate a proper production level. It's all, I'm telling you right now, production is all just math. That's all it really is. You just gotta dig into the numbers and they'll tell you everything. The, the, the data tells you everything if you just know where to look. If you don't know where to look, contact me and I'll show you where to look. Okay, it's easy to find. It's all in your POS system. Poor pricing in menu items is another huge thing too. I get this from a lot of places, I, you know. I just don't wanna, I don't think I, you know, I don't wanna charge that much. You need to charge what you need to charge to stay in business. Everyone here is a for-profit, no one's a charity? <laughs> Jennifer's on the verge of being a charity, but. I'm talking to people about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Her staff thinks she's a nonprofit. <laughs> That's it. Not running special items and stuff that are overproduced. Um, I'm not a big fan of the word specials. I like to use the word feature. Again, I'm a big, I like power of words. Special to me is something I'm just trying to get rid of. A feature means I'm trying to showcase something. Go ahead. Employee meals. Employee meals. How do y'all do that? How do y'all feel? Because I do personal meals. Okay, we do that, but there's this, like, chef gets really pissed because he's like, I feel like all I'm doing is cooking employee meals all day. How many employees do you have? She only has, like, 15. Three that go on shifts, and then you have three since five days or something. Yeah, tell me. So, fuck off. What was that, Cora? No one heard you in the back. <laughs> Your chef sounds very needy. And for, and for, I know what you pay him. That's very, he's very needy for what he gets paid. You guys are only hearing the highlights of the shit. Yeah. Don't have Donald out for a site visit. No, I definitely have Donald. I'll definitely have Donald come out for a site visit. Yeah. Definitely have me come. No. What about no. 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 The other that's, I'll tell you right now, you know what? That's, um, that's culture. Yeah. That's toxic what's culture. Perk, what's the perk of working there? Yeah. yeah. What's, what's the perk? On a busy day, we ask our employees to order their food and they come to work. Yeah. So that we know their lunch. Fuck yeah. I'm going to go, I'm going to go fire that fucker. No. Tip with you, you get it all done. <laughs> we 
the only time that I, I do a free meal is if people work a double shift. Yeah. Otherwise, you get a 30% off your meal. Yeah. I usually do a free meal if they work a double. Yeah. Yeah. But certain items too. I'm not gonna give them like you can't get steak off the menu. But you know, I'll give you something. I'll give you a double. I'll give it. Work a double. I'll give you a meal. All right. Here's what. Here's what I want you to do. On the group chat, type in what your food policy is for employees. How's that? So that way everyone can see and everyone can sort through the data. And we don't have this kind of talking on top of each other. Sound cool? How's that? All right. Bottom line. Food cost thieves are real, and they happen all the time. If again, if you don't have awareness, can't make better choices. If you don't make better choices, you're going to be stuck doing the same thing you do over and over and expecting different resu results, which is called insanity. Exactly. Doing the same thing and expecting different results is insanity. And unfortunately, most restaurants just like to do the same thing over and expect different things. If I don't train my team properly, and I'm telling you, like. 99% of the food, the 40 thieves of food cost is all proper training. That's all it really is. It's just training them the way you want it done and, and then holding them accountable to your expectations. And then remember the five, the daily five sermon. One is number four is standards. Expectations. That's not the way we do it. We do it like this. They're going to push back. No, I don't want it. You know, no, no, you know, it's easier for, no, <laughs> this is our standard guys. This is how we do things. I'm always calm about that. That's how we do things. That's our standard. It's not, and I usually use the word, it's not negotiable. As soon as I say it's not negotiable, what's that usually mean? It's not negotiable, <laughs> okay? You stop talking, it's not negotiable. It's like right then I just shut the door. It's not negotiable, it's the way we do it. I shut them down right away. It's not negotiable, it's the way we do it. It's our way. And if somebody keeps talking, it's not negotiable. It's not a discussion. It's not open for debate. It's not open for discussion. It's, it's, that's the way it is. You know, and I'm really polite about it. And I'm calm about it, but I'm just like, it's not open for debate. I don't have to like, you know, I've seen those owners like, you know, Jesus Christ, I told you, no, 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 we're not doing it like that. We're doing it like, don't lose your cool. When you elevate stuff, and we talked about emotions over the last three days, talk about emotional management, emotional intelligence, managing your emotion, emotional energy, energy levels. We talked about all these things. You have to maintain the culture. You have to maintain the balance. You have to maintain the energy level that you want all the time. You either run the restaurant or it runs you. Right now, and we talk about this working in your business stuff, on your business. When you're working in your business, you're establishing those three P framework, people, product, process. When you have that solid and you know it, it's basically a self-fulfilling circle the people in the process feed each other and they protect the product, which is the brand. Now you can take yourself out of the equation and be the operator and just manage it. But I'm still teaching the daily five sermon. Even when you're not even in your restaurant every day, when you're on the phone to anybody on your team, it's always a daily five. We talk about our mission, our core values. You're following the core values. You're following the vision. You're following the mission statements. Hey, our standards, expectations. I know it's on the P&L. We do this and this and this. I need you to do, you know, make, make sure we're watching this. Follow the budgets. Make sure we're following either, you know, doing this, make sure we're doing the production right, make sure we're adjusting PARs. I'm holding always my standards, my expectations. I'm setting goals for them. And then I'm also giving appreciate, hey man, I really appreciate all the work you do. You can get to that level where you don't have to have your restaurant run your life. <laughs> okay, hashtag write this down. <clears throat> Somebody's texting me like crazy. You must know where the bleeding is to stop it. You must know where the bleeding is to stop it. You have to know where the bleeding is. If you don't know where the bleeding is, it's just gonna keep going. When I was in pararescue, part of the pararescue training is, is basically paramedic training. First thing you do when you walk up on an unconscious person, we call it ABC, airway, bleeding, and we check circulation. We walk up, airway, are they breathing? We check bleeding, we usually do this hand sweep to see if there's any blood pooled or anywhere and they have blood coming out. And then we check their circulation, make sure they got a great, how strong their pulse is. Same thing, you gotta know where the bleeding is. That 40 thieves of food cost, if you have a food cost problem, it's in the 40 thieves, trust me. Always is. 40 years in the restaurant business, I can tell you with a shout out, 100% certainty, any food cost problem is hidden in that 40 thieves. 
in the top three are production, portion, and waste. That's the top three. And usually it's portion. If I had to pick one of the three, it's usually portion control. It's usually the number one thing. You know, you have this beautiful design pizza and it's supposed to be like, you know, six ounces of cheese. And then you got monster gorilla guy back there on the line and he's got a hand and it's like his standard size cheese is 12 ounces and he's my own monster, monster cheese man, you know. You know, and he's like dumping cheese on there and, and cheese, I don't know about you, but cheese right now is really expensive. You're like, oh my God, I see my cheese prices drop, you know, jumping up, my invoices are jumping up every week. That's what's kicking your ass. It's like you don't have any portion control measurements. You know, and then the guys will, and as soon as you try to enforce it, remember we talked about this resistance curve, you start something and then they give you resistance or pushback. Well, you know, man, I'd love, I'd love to weigh out the cheese, but man, it's really going to slow me down. You know, I won't be able to cook as many pizzas. That's just a story you're telling yourself. <laughs> That's just bullshit. That's a lie. And normally a couple of days into it, one of those turned around and be like, this is working great, actually. Yeah, yeah. Usually, yeah, after they kind of buy, that goes into the buy-in part. After they kind of, they push back because, again, it's another step for them. No, I've got to get a scale or I've got to have a thing and I've got to weigh the cheese out or put it in a cup and fill it to the top. Oh my God, you know how much it's going to slow me down? Oh my God, you know how much it kills me to write your paycheck every week? <laughs> Fuck. You know how much I got to sit down, I got to pull up the payroll, I got to calculate your hours, I got to send over the account, I got to send over the payroll company, the checks got to come back, I got to have them signed. Fuck. You know how much a pain in the ass it is for me? But I do it every time. Yeah. It's just part of the job. It's, and, and again, it goes back to, this is the way we operate. It's not negotiable. We measure our cheese. We measure our portions. That's how we operate, guys. That's just, you know, listen, I know there's other restaurants that don't care. We do care. We want a consistent product for our guests. To do that, we have to have some consistency rules, rules of engagement in, in place. One of those things is proper portioning. Proper portioning, proper plates. Another thing too is look at the size of your plates. I know a lot of chefs, and I've chefed it up too. Chefs like to chef shit up. I don't know why. <laughs> well, they chef shit up. Like chef, when we chef shit up, we like these really cool fucking huge plates. But the problem is a lot of times we have this really cool plate, don't we? Uh, we like to chef shit up. We have this really cool huge plate. I got a whole collection of these fucking plates at home. My girlfriend thinks, and I got one-offs. You know, it's like I don't have a set. I got like 25 huge fucking really cool edgy, really cool like plates for plating. But we have this like really cool plate and then we put this food in there really nice. You know, we make this nice beautiful frame. But then we put those same plates on the line with the guys and they're like putting stuff together and they're like, it looks empty. I'm gonna put more potatoes on here. Oh wait, now it looks unbalanced. I need more vegetables on here. Oh wait, probably needs more sauce to fill in this empty spot. Now my nice little tight plate becomes this huge overportioned shit, right? 60% food, food cost, yeah. I see this especially on steaks, I don't know why. It's like, I don't know why guys think that the bigger the steak, I gotta put more potatoes on it. Why? It just looks better. Why? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Sides. They're portioned out. Yeah, yeah. Specifically. And I don't remember which video it is that you have, but you're talking about when you're doing your food costs. Okay, so I've got my steak, I've got my mashed potatoes, I've got my truffle butter, I've got my... It was Bo. Wasn't it Bo yesterday talking about the menu matrix? No, you have a video talking about it too, where you're talking about you've got your food costs right now for mm -hmm. all the Oh, stuff, yeah, yeah. But then you go and you throw all of these... Extra shit on there, yeah. Yeah, all the extra garnish, which actually starts kicking your ass. Oh, his numbers are off, yep. Anything goes on the plate, it has to be costed. Yeah. If I'm doing like a chai boil, I want to make a recipe for chai boil, I want to cost out to the ounce, I want to measure it out and see how much is that little streak on the plate of chai boil. If I'm doing two sp a sprig of rosemary, that goes on the recipe card. Anything goes on the plate, has to go on the recipe card. Has to. Those little hidden costs. And then remember, inspect what you expect. If my recipe cost card says it's, you know, it's four ounces of starch, you know, three ounces of you know, potato or veg, 
and it's a portion of the protein this size. I'm going back and I'm randomly weighing proteins sometimes. I'm making sure they're using the right scoopers and dishers on the line to make sure the portions are right. I don't know how many times I've walked back in the kitchen and instead of using a disher, you know, for potatoes, and trust me, a lot of people say, well, I don't want to use a disher because it looks like those old fashioned scoop mashed potatoes from school, right? Because I use the disher doesn't mean you have to leave it like a disher. I can put it on the disher and I can use the other end and swirl it around and make it look different. I can use a spoon and draw a line through it. Now it has some presentation. Just because I use that scooper doesn't mean I have to leave it like that. It doesn't have to look like high school cafeteria food. Right? I can play with it. That's why I love having spoons. Take a spoon. Oh my God, <laughs> different. You take a scoop of mashed potatoes, put them on a plate. I tell you, you take the back of a, a, a serving spoon, put it in the mashed potatoes, drag it through. Totally looks different. And it also makes a nice little trough for your gravy. <laughs> it's easy stuff. All right. Here's what I want you to do for homework. Boom, boom, boom. You're going to go in the members area. When I upload the 40 Thieves of Food Cost Checklist, you're going to use it to identify your weaknesses and what you need to work on in your career create an action plan to correct them. Trust me, of the 40 thieves of food cost, you will have not many that you do. <laughs> You'll probably have probably of the 40 thieves of food cost, I'm probably going to say you at least have at least 50% that you're not doing at least. You're not doing 100% because you have an open jet. Yeah, you don't have a building yet, even. Yeah. Yeah, you and Liz are in the same boat. You guys get a pass on homework. So Liz and Candy, Caitlin and Mary do not have to do homework, but they have to do tequila shots corresponding to the number of, the of food costs thieves there are. So there's four of them. There's 40 thieves of food cost. Liz? I, that's not my, that's not, that's not on me. Liz, 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 Mary, Candy, and Caitlin, between the four of them, half, and Cora, what do you mean? Well, Cora wants to throw herself in there, because she's a good sport. Between the five of you, you have, and I don't care what the distribution is, 40 shots between the five of you. Oh my God. Between now and the next bathroom break. No, I'm kidding. What? So Liz and Cora are both mean drunks from what I hear. <laughs> See, fuck around, find out. Fuck around, find out. Cora, Cora has a tattoo on her arm. It says, fuck around, find out. I don't think it's on her arm, actually, but she won't tell me where exactly it's at, but that's okay. Chris says that he learned firsthand, fuck around and find out. Yeah. Yeah. Chris can't hear out of one ear because of her. <laughs> yeah, see, exactly. It was a pencil. <laughs> All right. Any other questions about that? Final thoughts. Food cost is huge. If you do not know your numbers, again, you don't know your business. Basically, you don't even have a business. What you have is a hobby, a very, very expensive hobby. All right. I wonder if Bo's coming. <laughs> was Bo here? Bo this morning? I haven't seen Bo at all this morning. All right. Here's what we'll do. We got, a, we got another Ava video to watch. I'm going to give you a five-minute break to take a bathroom break real quick. We'll watch. come back watch that Ava video. Her video is like 20 minutes. It's going to be about social media marketing.